Welcome to the Minor Consult. Last month, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Stanford Medicine's own Abraham Verghese for a conversation in front of a live audience here at Stanford. A world-class physician and gifted educator, Abraham is also a best-selling author. His most recent novel, The Covenant of Water, has received rave reviews and is firmly positioned on the New York Times bestseller list. In our conversation, we explored the real-life family history that inspired his book and the medical mystery at its heart. We also discussed his creative process, how he balances his writing with practicing and teaching medicine, and what it's like when Oprah Winfrey enthusiastically recommends your novel to millions of fans around the world. So without further ado, let's get into our episode. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. It's delighted to see a room full of people who, like me, are very eager to have a conversation today with Dr. Abraham Verghese about his most recent book, uh, The Covenant of Water. And after, we'll chat here for 30 or 35 minutes and then uh, very much open it up to your questions. It's a true privilege and honor to welcome uh, Dr. Verghese. Um, he is, he needs no introduction, but he's an extraordinary clinician, uh, professor, and of course, highly accomplished writer. Um, he is, the, he's a professor and the Linda R. Meyer and Joan F. Lane Provostial Professor and Vice Chair for the Theory and Practice of Medicine here at the Stanford School of Medicine. He's also the founder of the Presence Center and he's a passionate advocate for the medical humanities and an ardent supporter of bedside medicine. And for many of you, many of you know that his Stanford 25, in other words, the 25 steps of uh, history and physical examination uh, has been used widely in medical curricula around the world, and he is an extraordinary educator here in our School of Medicine and in our health system. Abraham, welcome. It's delightful to be able to chat with you today about, uh, about your most recent book and about your career and your life. So thank you for joining me today. It's a great, great pleasure to be here at home, so to speak, and uh, with lots of friends that I see. So thank you all for, for coming out today. An honor. Well, so maybe we can start by talking about The Covenant of Water, and um, it, it, it's a magisterial book. It, I hope many of you here have read it. If you haven't, uh, again, I hope you will. Uh, I, I read it this summer, and I, I started it when I was away because I knew when I started I wouldn't want to put it down, and that was indeed the case. And um, it's, it's so remarkably well written, and of course, you've already received a lot of acclaim for it. Maybe you can um, talk to us about the motivation for the book, um, how you got the idea for both the setting as well as the plot. Um, and I know that there are connections in your family uh, to, to the, how the book is written and, and, and some of the lead characters in the book. But maybe you could describe that to us and, its, and the significance of the book to your upbringing. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. So um, when I finished Cutting for Stone, I felt sort of, you know, th there's always this feeling of how can I ever top that, you know? Yeah. And uh, Cutting for Stone was really quite autobiographical for me in the sense that I was born in Ethiopia and the character characters were following some of the milestones of my life. Um, so I think the biggest decision one makes is where to set the new novel. You know, first of all, to be ready to write one, and then where to set it. And I, I, um, Ethiopia was easy because I was born there. I knew it intimately. India, I knew pretty well, but not quite as well because uh, I wasn't born there. Uh, I would go to visit my parents every summer, and uh, you know, two months, and it was you know delightful. And then later, when my medical school was interrupted in Africa, I wound up finishing medicine in India. So I had you know, a great degree of familiarity, but not that of the native, and I was hesitant um, until I, I, I came across this document that my mother had written. Uh, when my mother was in her 70s, she had, you know, she, she had an incredible story herself, you know, a, a single woman answering an ad for a teaching position in Africa uh, and she was a graduate in physics, and so she sails off to Africa alone 
meets my father there hard from the same part of India and then they spend a, most of their active career there but at some point she comes to America and gets a master's degree from Columbia and then goes back to Ethiopia, eventually teaches high school in New Jersey and then retires to Florida. And at one point, my five-year-old niece asked my mom, she said, uh, Amachi, which means grandmother, what was it like when you were a five-year-old girl? And my mom was so taken by that question that she began to write in a notebook, in an exercise book, with illustrations, because she was a very good artist. And uh, it, it wound up being a 120-page document, uh, uh, an heirloom in the family. We made copies of it. And I revisited that manuscript when I finished Cutting for Stone. And I just had this epiphany that, OK, this is where the geography needs to be. So that's how it came about. I also feel that our particular community in South India is is an interesting one. First of all, the state is interesting. It's a coastal strip of territory on India's west coast. And uh, you know, it's sort of compressed between the ocean on one side, mountains on uh, inland, and 40 rivers coming down and breaking into this latticework of canals and backwater. So geographically, it's a very interesting place. It's the place where spices were grown, the Spice Coast, it was called. But within that state, there is a small Christian sect, small by Indian standards, uh, and we call ourselves St. Thomas Christians. And uh, the, the thinking is that St. Thomas the Apostle landed on the coast of India in 52 AD and converted some locals, and then it's grown to this community. And so, you know, my name, Abraham Verghese, uh, Verghese is really George that became Gorgis in Greece and Borghese in Italy. So. You, know, you can sort of see that old, old Testament roots there. Mm -hmm. And there haven't been that many novels that most people know about set in that community. The only one I think has uh, widely been read is The God of Small Things by Arundhati Roy, the same community. So that's really the genesis of this. I knew I wanted to set the novel in Kerala. My mother's stories of her childhood were just intriguing. And I'd heard most of those stories, but I, I felt they could be the basis for a lot of the, the start of the book. And uh, more than that, I think the powerful influence of my grandmothers, both my grandmothers, were in their own way quietly heroic women. They were very unassuming. The world would never know about them. They suffered great tragedies. Uh, you know, Each of them lost a child. My one grandmother lost an 11-year-old boy to typhoid fever. And my other grandmother lost my father's oldest brother when he was, I think, 14, to rabies. You know, the, so they had real life tragedies that they somehow weathered and they went on because of their faith and you know, to their community, they were sort of legendary in a sense. But the world doesn't know much about them and I really wanted to write with a character like that uh, in my mind to begin the book at least. So that's sort of the genesis. Abraham, you've, you've written that you went into medicine because of a novel, mm -hmm. and then you became a writer because of a patient. Uh, could you describe that to us? First of all, the novel that, that led you to a career in medicine, and then, of course, this precedes uh, The Covenant of Water, but then the patient experience that drove you to become a writer, and then maybe we'll also transition and, and without giving anything away, talk about some of the medical experiences relayed in The Covenant of Water. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think it was true of a generation of physicians, perhaps many in this room, that it was a book that called many of us to medicine. And uh, in America, that book was Aerosmith by Sinclair Lewis, very often. Uh, in the Commonwealth and the UK, it was The Citadel by A.J. Cronin. But for me, it was, it was the book of human bondage. And I think it, it sort of illustrates how books speak to each one of us individually. I mean, and there's no rhyme or reason to it. Uh, Proust said that the reader reads the book, but the reader is reading him, himself or herself, which I think is very true. So there was, you know, of human bondage doesn't have much medicine in it, but at some point the main protagonist, Philip, goes to medical school, and at some point he arrives on the wards, and uh, Somerset Maugham describes that moment um, as follows. 
Philip saw humanity there in the rough, the artist's canvas, and he said to himself, this is something I can be good at. And, uh, you know, for some reason, those lines really spoke to me, you know, um, because I was a, a mediocre student, I would say. I was in a lot of trouble. I had an older brother who had excelled in everything, and I would arrive two years after he had charmed all the teachers and <laughs> wind up being this great disappointment. And he was and is a sort of a math whiz. In fact, he's a professor at MIT. And his genius was evident very early on. And I was kind of lost. I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. But those lines suggested to me that you know, not anybody could be a great artist, as Philip, the protagonist of uh, of human bondage wanted to be. Not everybody could be a great mathematician or a great writer, but anybody with a basic curiosity about the human condition, empathy, uh, a willingness to work hard, could be a good physician. So that's what I took away. And it was a, a powerful moment for me. You know, I think uh, middle class Indian parents are you know, very much, I think, like middle class Jewish parents in the sense that as a child you get the message that you can be a, a doctor, lawyer, engineer, or a failure. And these, are, <laughs> <laughs> these are your options, you know. And uh, I, I just knew then I wanted to be a physician, but it was, coming, it was happening for all the right reasons, I thought. I wasn't pleasing anyone but myself. And then after I'd been in practice, I mean, I was a fellow in Boston during the onslaught of the first HIV uh, cases and, you know, lived through all that drama and then got to a small town in Tennessee as a junior faculty person. And everyone said that in that town of 50,000, I could expect to take care of one HIV-infected person every other year, maybe. Instead of which, in a fairly short time, I found myself following 100 people with HIV infection. <clears throat> and I, I, I felt clearly that I had stumbled onto an American paradigm, uh, a, a, a uniquely American story that was playing out in every small town. And the paradigm goes like this. Uh, a young man grows up in a small town and leaves for all the reasons that you and I leave small towns, jobs, opportunity, education. But in their case, they were also leaving because they were gay and did not want to live that lifestyle under the close scrutiny of their friends and relatives. And they went to the big city, found themselves, and then decades later, the virus had found them, and they were now coming back to their hometowns, typically because their partners had died, they'd cared for them. And so there I was at the tail end of this uh, you know, migration, and uh, I wrote a scientific paper describing this phenomenon. It was a widely cited paper, and uh, lots of small town people responded saying, exactly, this is what we're seeing. But I felt at that moment that the, um, that the cold and at times unimaginative language of science couldn't begin to capture the tragic nature of this voyage, couldn't begin to capture the heartache of the families, uh, could, couldn't begin to capture my own grief at you know, watching this happen again and again, mostly young men my age at the time, with a fatal illness that I had no, nothing in my armamentarium that might have helped them. And so that was the moment I decided I would, whatever happened, I would take a break and try to write that story. And I've always been a big reader of fiction. I've always been a believer in fiction uh, because it changed my life, you know. And I think there's a nice saying that I like, that fiction is the great lie that tells the truth about how the world lives. And, uh, you know, I, I had the ambition to take that story and make it a novel. For complex reasons, it wound up being a nonfiction story. But uh, that is when I became a writer. Right. <clears throat> As a fiction writer, you've, you've developed a very distinctive style. And um, I, I'm not a critic of fiction, but, uh, but I think the way you use metaphor, for example, um, is so revealing. And, and I always look forward with each paragraph as to what the next reference is going to be and what the next connection uh, that you as a writer have drawn between a circumstance you're developing and describing to us as a reader and something that has happened in another aspect of the world that the reader can immediately see the relationship. Um, 
and I know that has to require a huge amount of thought and planning, but how have you, uh, you, you participated in the Iowa, Iowa Writers Workshop, and, but how did you go about, uh, as a physician, uh, learning your craft as a writer, and then how has that evolved into now you're widely recognized as one of your generation's most accomplished fiction writers. Um, can you walk us through that process? Yeah, I'm, I must confess that I'm, I'm not really aware of, of a distinct style that I could codify okay. and describe. But I, I can tell you that um, you know, when I went to Iowa, the, the Iowa Writers Workshop, it only met one afternoon a week to discuss two stories. And what the, really, the real thing Iowa gave me was the time to read extensively, catch up with all the things that, all the books people were discussing that I had not read because I was busy doing medicine, and also to write and find my voice. And that was very helpful because the, the kind of thing that your spouse thinks is wonderful and your mother thinks is, thinks is precious generally doesn't fly there. You find out. <laughs> In fact, if your spouse becomes deeply disturbed by what you're writing, you're onto something. You know, <laughs> you, found, you found your voice. Uh, but I think if I have a style, it probably is emulating some of the writers that I really admire. For example, Somerset Maugham, as much the, as much as his book influenced me, it's a very spare, you know, nuts and bolts style. There's there isn't a lot of fluff in it. I'm less attracted to that than say a stylist like Gabriel Garcia Marquez or mm. Going even further back, uh, there was a book that William Osler uh, claimed ha he had by his bedside and loved. And since I'm a great fan of Osler, I read the book. It was uh, Thomas Brown's Religio Medici, you know, the religion of a physician. And uh, it's a very ornate style. And also, it was spelled in Old English. So it's actually hard to read unless you get a hold of a copy that isn't, doesn't throw you off with the strange spellings. But once you do, it's these long, flowing, beautiful sentences. Uh, and Marquez does a lot of that, too. And I, I, I think I sort of unconsciously wind up writing to emulate those kinds of stylists. Uh, but nothing you see on the page is, is sort of born there on the page. You know, it's, uh, it's hundreds of revisions. It's many, many attempts to keep shaping and reshaping. And sometimes it's ruthless cutting where you've gone, you've gone overboard. So. Um, I think most people, my editor would say that I have a long style in the sense that I want to tell everything about an event, and sometimes you can't. You have right. to really pare it down. Right. Each of your works of fiction has integrated medical concepts. A story, medicine and an illness mm -hmm. or illnesses play a prominent role in how the plot of the novel develops. And uh, of course, that relates to your, your world as a physician. But how have you thought about that? And maybe, again, without discussing too much about the book, for those who haven't read it, uh, you do describe uh, a, a medical condition in, in the book. And it, it, it forms a prominent part of some of the things that happen to uh, protagonists in the book. Uh, how did you come about uh, you know, deciding to focus on that? And, um, and, and Maybe if you could speak about how you weave in medicine, because anyone who reads your works also learns a fair amount about <laughs> medical practice and, um, and pathology as a part of understanding uh, what's going on with the characters. Well, I must say, I, I, I'm, I've, I, I went into medicine because I saw it as a romantic and passionate pursuit. And yeah. you know, I've never lost that feeling. I just love medicine. I mean, obviously there are moments where it's not romantic and passionate, but the, one, the times that it is uh, carry you through. And I actually feel that um, I've always resisted maybe somewhat disingenuously the, the notion that I wear two hats, that I'm a writer and I'm a physician, because I really feel, maybe incorrectly, that I'm all physician. And I'm looking at the world through the lens of my you know, wonderful privilege of being a physician. And so, but, but I also feel like, what is medicine but life plus plus? It's life on steroids. It's life at its most closely observed and life at its most tragic and consequential moments. So 
you know, as a writer with that in, uh, who has that insight, I, why would I not use it? So I was very drawn to bringing medicine into my story. Even if I tried to write a story that wasn't about medicine, I suspect that it would make its way there. <laughs> but with Covenant of Water, for example, I mean, I think I, I'm very drawn to epic novels that, that take place over many generations. I mean, I, I just love that feeling. You pick up a novel and, you know, generations pass, centuries pass, and you put down the book and it's Tuesday, you know? Right. <laughs> um, I don't know of any other instrument in our modern world that can suspend time the way an epic novel can. And so I had in mind, and it was, you know, a consequence of setting the novel in Kerala with these old families, I had in mind several generations. And one of the things that I've loved in medicine, I'm sure you could relate to this, is you know, there are observations made in one decade, and then in the course of our lifetime, we have observed those observations go from mystery or something with a name to being, you know, sorted out in the most elegant way. I, I love to tell the story of your, your superior collicular syndrome, uh, you know, which I think is a, is a great example. This must have been happening forever. Yeah. And then finally, medical progress. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to, Explain that quickly, because the audience is going to be <laughs> mystified, and yet that's a great illustration of the drama that I think exists in medicine. Sure. Well, I, earlier in my career, I described an inner ear disorder. Um, we could go on about this, but we won't. Uh, so we, we have balance, three balance canals in our inner ear that act as a gyroscope and give our brain information about how our head is moving angularly in space. And in about 2% of people, the bone that should cover the top balance canal fails to form normally. And in some proportion of those later in life, that bone becomes eroded. And then the balance canal, rather than just sending the brain information about balance, it begins to respond to sound as well. Because sound is just a mechanical wave in fluid. Ordinarily, it travels through the cochlea, the hearing organ. But if there's an opening in the bone covering this balance canal, it can also travel through the balance canal, and the brain interprets that as motion in the plane of that canal. And patients develop a constellation of balance-related symptoms. And it, as Abraham was saying, it it's actually was described in the literature a more than a century ago in terms of patients, but its cause was never elucidated. It was, there are bizarre series of suggestions of what it could be due to, and then we were able to sort of elucidate the cause in uh, the mid-90s when I was early in my career at Johns Hopkins. And um, it's led to, we developed a surgical procedure to fix it and diagnostic criteria. Um, and it has been a very rewarding thing to see, you know, what had been a mystery become actually very scientifically well understood and uh, with some well-defined criteria for diagnosis and then fortunately an effective therapy, which in many people is not needed, but when it is needed, then the surgery can be very beneficial. Well, I just love that. I mean, I'm, the patient, if I remember right, first came to you to say, yeah. loud noises make me dizzy. Was that's that, right. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, something that's bizarre. And medicine is full of those little bizarre moments, which I, which I love to collect. And so when writing Covenant, I had in mind uh, introducing a condition that was genetic that would be revealed in the third generation. Because one thing about this this sort of insular community I belong to is arranged marriages all take place within this community, which amplifies, you know, uh, genetic disorders. And so a family's reputation was everything. And so I invested this family with a rare disorder that uh, uh, makes them averse to water and also gives them a propensity for drowning. Um, in shallow bodies of water, even though, they're avo even though they avoid water, they wind up drowning. Now, I take a lot of liberties with the actual condition, which is actually a very small kindred in southern Pennsylvania or something, but I've made it into more than it is. But I think that's the great joy of fiction is you can make up as long as it's believable. If you reach a point where the reader suspends their disbelief, then it's all, it's all over. Uh, so, you know, that was a very interesting thing to introduce. The family calls it the condition, but by the third generation, it's finally sorted out. And so I love that kind of play in, uh, in, in medicine. Shortly after The Covenant of Water was released, you got a call 
from Oprah. Yeah. And uh, maybe you can describe that call and what that call has led to. I'm not sure many people know, but, uh, but, but we'd love to hear from you about that first call yeah. and then the okay. subsequent interactions. Yeah, I'd love to talk about it. I'm still in disbelief a little bit. <laughs> you know. But I was in my sweats and uh, <laughs> at my desk, and uh, my publisher had said, we're going to call you at 10 o'clock to talk about the printing. And it seemed kind of, you know, I didn't quite understand what they wanted my opinion on this for. And 10 o'clock passed, it was more like 10.20, and the phone rang, and that you know, beautiful reverberating voice said, hi, this is Oprah Winfrey, you know? And, <laughs> and I didn't believe it. I, actually, <laughs> I thought someone, some, one of my many buddies across the state is pulling my leg, or one of my brothers. And so I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know? and, and she says later that I was in such disbelief that she basically began talking about the book in such detail and that it was beginning to sink in that I'm talking to Oprah Winfrey. And my first thought was, I'm in sweats, you know, <laughs> as if she could see me. And it's very strange. Um, but I mean, you would think that Oprah would have been on my radar. She should have been. It's, it's something an author would want. But it had, she had been for my previous book. I had really wished it. I had really thought this book has all the elements that she will like. It has Africa. It has you know, sort of big story about fistula and so on. And uh, with this book, it just had never crossed my mind. It just seemed like I was destined not to have those sorts of things happen to me, uh, you know. Um, but it, and, and I told her this eventually on, on, the, on the Super Soul podcast we did. I said, you know, I lit a candle, which is true. I lit a candle hoping that she would pick my book for Cutting for Stone. I'm big on lighting candles. I mean... I know it's not validated, there's no randomized trials, <laughs> but I do it. And uh, I said, but it didn't work because you didn't pick Cutting for Stone. She said, no, I think you're looking at it the wrong way. It worked, but it wasn't for that book. <laughs> you know? okay. So, yeah, so she picked the book, and um, a month before it was released, we had to keep it quiet. Not even my trusted assistant had any clue that this was happening. And... Uh, the publishers had in mind how many more books to print because Oprah, Oprah's pick has a predictable effect. And, and yet they had not anticipated her enthusiasm for the book. I mean, she got so behind the book that within the first week of launching, we were all out of books in many stores. Uh, Barnes & Noble didn't have enough. Amazon didn't have enough. They were scrambling. And I think that was just her enthusiasm, her, her passion for the book, which... I don't quite know how to explain except to be very, very joyful. I, I feel a bit sorry for her next pick and the next pick because though they may be picked, uh, I don't think they can count on this <laughs> enthusiasm she's been having for her. So she's become someone I have the privilege of talking to fairly regularly. She's a very wise counselor having, I mean, there is nobody she hasn't talked to, nothing she hasn't sort of delved into. So. On a personal level, it's been very, you know, just wonderful to have a, a mentor like that. Not, not, not just, not just about books. Not at all about books, but about life in a sense. So, it's a, it was a big moment. That's wonderful. Yeah. And and how many copies of the books have of the book has have been distributed thus far, roughly? Uh, yeah, I think the keyword is distributed because books no, will be returned. Said, but right. uh, you know, I think that's there's something like five hundred thousand books out in bookstores or probably sold, or, but until they return, you don't know. And about 150,000 audiobooks downloaded. And you know, everyone focuses on the New York Times list, and you know, I do too. And we're still on there 21 weeks later. But there's another metric that most people don't know about, which is Amazon every week publishes the most read books. And it's very hard to find out how they calculate that metric. But as it turns out, it's pretty simple. It's the number of books plus e-books plus audiobooks. And that number uh, is such that I have been the number one uh, most read book on Amazon for 20 weeks now. That's amazing. And yesterday I went down to number two. Oh. <laughs> I'm not complaining. No. You know? So for a writer, you know, it's, um, it's kind of a dream. And I, I really have the sense, so one of my good friends asked me, just, what are you working on next? 
I'm not working on anything nice. <laughs> you know, I really have a sense that I will never be able to top this. I mean, I'll gradually get really? back to writing at some point, but I feel no compulsion to immediately, you know, uh, capitalize on this in a sense. You know, I, I think it's the mistake I made with Cutting for Stone. People, the book was well received, and other publishers immediately thought, well, this is a guy who can lay the golden egg. He'll do it again. And uh, they gave me an advance, and it was became a big cross on my shoulders to have this advance and deadlines. And, and uh, I mean, I had to sort of suffer, change publishers. As you know, I went through a lot of trial yeah. with this book. And it's a miracle that there's, you know, that I managed to produce another good story. But I won't make the mistake of taking an advance or signing with anybody else. If I write again and if I write a good book at some point, I'll try to sell it. And that's how I feel. That's wonderful. You mentioned the audio book, and you do, you do read the book for the audio version. And to speak to us about <clears throat> how that came about, because I believe when we had a conversation, you had to actually audition was, to be yeah. the, uh, the reader. Yeah. And, then, um, and then I think, how many hours did you devote to the actual project itself? But maybe describe to us sure. that process. Yeah, it was about a two and a half week process. So, you know, uh, I think most people don't know this, but it should be a red flag for you if you see an author reading their own book. It should be. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm listening right now to Ann Patchett's Tom Lake. It's narrated by Meryl Streep. Uh, I just mm. finished listening to her previous book, Dutch House, and that was uh, narrated by Tom, Tom Hanks. You know, so writers aren't trained to perform, so you know, we, we shouldn't normally be the ones recording the book. Uh, uh, Cormac McCarthy's The Crossing was narrated by Brad Pitt. I mean, these are really people who know how to do this thing. But I had been disappointed with Cutting for Stone, even though the audiobook did great. Many people came to the book through that. Only I knew, and a few other people knew, that the narrator had mangled certain words. For example, there's a way a North Indian says Madras, which is in South India, in a contemptuous way. That, that sounds like, oh, those hicks down there. So instead of saying Madras the way I would say it, they'll say Madras. You know, it was very guttural way, which was like a spike in my heart every time I heard it. You know? <laughs> and this book is chock full of ethnic words and pronunciations. And I thought I, I would rather be the one to do those parts. And so I will audition for it. And luckily, they, they, they picked me. But I had to learn. <laughs> it's not a given. But I had to learn how to perform it. So you have to you know, learn how to pitch your voice so that in a given page of dialogue, it's clear if a woman is speaking or a man is speaking, or two different men. I had to learn how to do the various accents, you know, Glaswegian, uh, Gordy from Newcastle, and uh, Upper Crust British, and Cockney British, and all the regional Indian accents. And it was a lot of fun. Well, the engineers and the, and the uh, producer were, were wonderful coaches. And whenever we had a, a question, uh, I, I remember uh, you know, calling my colleagues here at work uh, and asking them, hey, my colleague from Glasgow, would you just, uh, you know, just say this sentence around? Don't ask me why, just say it. <laughs> and then recording them and then, you know, so I had, a, I, I prayed on a lot of different people here to, <laughs> to get things right. But it was a lot of fun and took three, three weeks and uh, I've just been delighted that it's been, uh, and I should tell you this, this is interesting that they have all this AI technology to take out a whole lexicon of things they have, of things you take out, such as stomach noises, clicks, pips. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's a dictionary of sounds that they just remove. And so I finally listened to the cleaned up version, and I didn't like it. And I think it's partly, mm. we're not used to hearing the sound of our voice, except in the echo chamber of our own skull, you know? Sure. And sure. so I was really holding my breath about the whole thing, uh, but then, you know, I was very fortunate that it, 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 the audience seemed to like it, and uh, it became the number one download. Uh, I should also men mention, Lloyd, that you know, talking about medical conditions and hearing, um, as you know, I've, I've struggled with my hearing for the last, uh, for a long time, for about 20, 25 years. But in the last five years, and certainly in the last 10 years, it's deteriorated quite a bit. And so it's no accident that Hearing is a major theme in the book, and it ties in with that condition. I don't have the condition in case anybody worries, 
but I do have you know garden variety inherited sensorineural deafness, with all its attended you know social consequences, and so I did tap into that for this sure. book. Yeah. Thank you. We let's open it up for questions. We have time for two or three questions, and I think we have a microphone circulating around. So please raise your hand, and if you might please uh, identify yourself and then ask your question for Abraham. I'm Ko Shali. I work at um, the Stanford, Stanford Cancer Institute. And my question was, what do you carry in your doctor's bag these days? What do you carry in, in your doctor's bag these days? <laughs> so that's interesting. Um, I did used to carry a doctor's bag. I, I stopped carrying it at, uh, at Stanford, but I, for the longest time I did. Now I just get my white coats reinforced so I can shove a lot of things in there. <laughs> but uh, there was this Indian American ex ex exhibit at the Smithsonian and they asked for my doctor's bag. And so for a little while, my doctor's bag was sitting in the Smithsonian. And my, my partner, Carrie, and I, and my, and my brother, we all went to see it <laughs> as part of this exhibit. And as far as I know, the bag is still there. <laughs> and what was in it was you know, just the usual things an internist, I think, should carry. I would had my ophthalmoscope, blood pressure cuff, reflex hammers, prescription pads, you know, all kinds of odds and ends in there, including uh, I worked in a very old VA, so uh, I kept a wrench in there. <laughs> because from time to time, you had to work on the plumbing or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it could always come in handy. <laughs> Abraham, thank you very much for joining me today for the conversation. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for listening to The Minor Consult with me, Stanford School of Medicine Dean Lloyd Minor. I hope you enjoyed today's discussion with best-selling novelist and Stanford Medicine professor, Dr. Abraham Verghese. Please send your questions by email to theminorconsult at theminorconsult.com and check out our website, theminorconsult.com, for updates, episodes, and more. To get the latest episodes of The Minor Consult, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate the podcast five stars. Your feedback helps make this podcast happen. Thank you so much for joining me today. I look forward to our next episode. Until then, stay safe, stay well, and be kind. Bye.